as a correction officer, I decide whether right. you live or die. I decide that. So the way it worked is I would let the inmate out, tell them to go and sweep and mop over here or go get the supplies and do this and that. They wanted to have 1500 a pop. I get 500 she gets a, a grand, and she did it like two or three times a week. This is a superficial thing for me to say. What did this chick look like? It's not a superficial because you know better. Maybe she had a great personality or something. I don't know. But do you guys call yourself guards or correctional officers? Well, it's correction officers, but around the world, it's they all call hard. correction officers guards. Yeah, yeah. Correction officers thing is like it's a, it's a kind of like a slight or a disrespect to call call them a guard because right. uh, you know law enforcement you know, extraordinary. So, all right. Well, you were in Rikers Island. How long were you at Rikers? 10 years. Um, were you born in New York? I mean, did you? Yes. Um, I'm born and raised in Harlem, New York city, you know, okay. Polo Grounds projects. Okay. Were your, I mean, you know, did you have both parents, a single mother, what? single, single mother. My, my father left the home when I was about a year and a half old, you know, had an off and on relationship with him, you know, until he passed. Um, so roughly it's just my mom raised me, my brother, and my sister. Okay. Um, were you, I mean, you went to school. Did you, what, you know, did you want to be law enforcement when you were growing up? What, what, what were you thinking when you were in high school? You know? Well, here's the thing. And I think most in a city, uh, people who live in these uh, type of environments that I've brought up with your mom, well, my mother and, and everybody else's mother um, kind of instilled in us that, you know, in, in my era, rap was relevant. You know, everybody's trying to be a rapper or everybody's trying to be a basketball player. Everybody didn't have those skills. So what it was in order to quote unquote, make it, make it out the, uh, the urban environment, is you get yourself a city or state job and you do right. 20, 30 years, get a pension. And during that course of time, you can move your family to a better neighborhood, go to better schools, et cetera, like that. So, no, I didn't have any ambition to be a correction officer. It's just that when I was growing up, my brother joined the Marines. I was still in school and got in some trouble in school and uh, ended up dropping out of school. So he came back from the Marines and, you know, all gung ho and everything and uh, took me down to the recruiter. And you know how the recruiters can be real persistent, taking you out to dinner, wine and then dining you to get you to sign in. So um, I became a Marine because I had a, uh, I didn't even have my GED. And at the time they were taking individuals without GEDs. So I thought it was a way for me to escape, a way for me to get out, you know, um, become a mature grown man. So June 3rd, I went and took the, the test to get into the military. June 6th, I was on that plane going to Paris Island to be a Marine. So just, okay. just yeah. like that. How old were you? 18? 19. 19. Okay. I had, yeah. I had, yeah. 19. I mean, that seems like a smart move. You know what I'm saying? They'll take care of like, I mean, it. it's, I'm sure it's hell, but at least you have somebody, at least you have direction and you have someone to, you know, point you in the right direction and you have a structure and. But so you don't know that until you go through it. Right. You're terrified because you hear all the stories about Marine Corps boot camp. <laughs> you know, so how, you really don't, you really don't know how shape, how good a shape you are until you go through that. <laughs> right. How was it? It was, uh, it's, it was enlightening to me because coming from Harlem in 19, I went in, in 1987. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to be straight up. It wasn't that many uh, white people in my neighborhood that I had right. to interact with on a daily basis. So now I've become a Marine and it's like a cesspool. People from all over the world. This is the, the first time I, it was a guy named Pettit. And this is the first time in my life ever that I've really seen somebody with natural red hair and red hair on a, you know, on a, like this, like it was a red, he had red hair big guy from the country, you know, and as you exchange story, exchange stories with them, I tell them I lived in a projects, 30 stories tall, elevator goes up and there's like 12 apartments. There was like, you, y'all live like an ant colony. You know, they were an elevator, you know, at the time coming from the country, if you never been to any city. Yeah. Living in a building, 30 stories tall, they were afraid. Am I afraid of heights? And until you 
you know, you witness it or experience it, then you understand where, where I'm coming from. Just like I couldn't understand how somebody 12 years old already was knowing how to drive tractors and drive big trucks. When in New York City, if you get your license before 30 at that time, you- I was gonna you say, you don't even need a car. You don't even need a car in New York. No, nah. no, not at all. But it was an experience, you know, I wouldn't trade so, it for a world now. So did you, I mean, did you, how long were you, I'm assuming you went through boot camp. I'm assuming, you know, there were no problems or how did, how long were you in the, in the uh, Marines? Well, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. The recruiter lied to me. Right. One of, no. one, of the questions, <laughs> one of the questions I asked them, you know, it, when you're young, you feel like you're pretty much invincible that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm scared about the training that I heard Marines go through, but I was more scared, afraid about, um, are we going to war? You know, that was one of the questions I asked him and he was like, oh, it's peacetime. Don't worry about it. You know, it's peacetime right now. It's no threats or nothing like that. So I took his word for it. And in 1989 and 90, I ended up in Desert Storm, Desert Shield in a war. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so that's the only thing I really, I could say went wrong. Everything else was just life changing experiences, but becoming a man, being away from home because I'm from New York, stationed in Camp Pendleton, California, you know, seeing different cultures, like a cesspool of people from all over the world in California. You know, first time I seen a black guy with a 10 gallon hat and a belt and boots and, and, and really dancing to country music. So it was an eye opening for me coming from the city, from Harlem. So, well, how was, uh, um, you said you were in Desert Shield. Desert Storm, Desert Shield. That's the name okay. of it. So what, I mean, how long were you there? Uh, two years. Did you see any action or? Oh yeah. I'm a decorated war veteran. Okay. Why did you get out? Um, at the time, um, I had my, my daughter was born. And I never, I hadn't laid eyes on at all because I was out in Desert Storm, Desert Shield. And when I came back, okay, the way the military is, my time to get out of the military came and went when I was over in the war. Once you're in the war, you can't come home until the war is over. Right. So, every day speaking, you sign, you enlist for four years. If within that four years, if you got like six months left and the war breaks out and you're over in, in war, you you have to be there for the duration until you can uh till the war's over and you know hopefully you make it home right. and then you decide if you want to stay or if you want to go i decided after being there two years past my time that i i was going to stay but i wanted to go see my daughter at least lay eyes on her physically and they were doing a turnaround they were going right back and that's why i said no Cause I don't know about what's going to happen this next time around. So that's when I, you know, elected to get out so I can uh, be with my daughter, be around my kids. So, I mean, what was your plan when you got out? Uh, no plan really. Uh, cause but you get out with a little bit of money. You've got a little yes. chunk of money. Yes. Yes. You know, but if you are, I'm not going to say uneducated, if you don't have a plan, that yeah. money goes fast if you don't have a plan of action. And when I got out of the military, of course, what's what's the jobs available? Security, law enforcement. You know, if you're a big guy, construction, you work to your strengths. Now, at the time, I did have a, a little bit of computer savvy because I was an aviation maintenance administration inside the military. So um, basically, still following what? Uh, my mama told me, took all the city exams to be a police officer and a correction officer, and corrections caught me first. Oh, okay. And and it was for, for Rikers Island? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so who runs Rikers Island? Is it the like the sheriff's department? Uh, or? Corrections. The corrections department. So it's, runs it, Rikers. It's that, so it's a state facility. It's a... Uh, City, it's a city jail. It's like um, when you any county, it's like a county jail for New York City. Okay, I was gonna say because so, you know what, like in most, not all cities, but I mean not all states, but in most states, you know the the county sheriff runs the jail. 
You know, even if you have like a police department, you typically end up like, let's say you got arrested in Tampa, mm-hmm. you, uh, Hillsborough County is going to put you in their jail for the Tampa PD. But okay. some, some cities are so large that they have their own jail systems, but most are, let's face it. Most places aren't in New York city. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's insane. It's not like it's twice as big as Tampa. It's 350 to 500 times as big as Tampa. You know, it's yeah. massive. So, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know if you've been to Tampa, but I grew up thinking Tampa was a city because there was like, there's like 10 buildings that are more than, you know, 30 feet high. That's a city. That, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. and now you go to, you, I'm like, that. Tampa's not a city. Like you go to New so York. And you, you've never, you never, you've never came to New York? Uh, only, yeah. Uh, about two years ago, I've been twice since then, but okay. two years ago. So, you know, I'd seen it, but it's not, you, you don't understand until you've driven you know, over that bridge into the city, how it's like, this isn't a large city. This is buildings as far as you can see. And it, listen, my, my, my wife grew up in like Okeechobee and the the tallest building in Okeechobee is like three stories high. I mean, it's, she, she she was, I was shocked. She was just like, it's her second time on an airplane. She was going, Mm -hmm. this is insane. You know, so, Mm -hmm. We're, you know, we're Florida, you know, hey. country, you know, bumpkins. Because listen, ninety percent of Florida is basically pickup trucks and dairy feet, uh, dairy farms, and you know, hey, it's not all beaches. It ain't all my, Miami. <laughs> Trust me. So, so, so they have. So okay, so it's 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 the it's New York City's personal jail. Yes, it's like a, right. it's like the city jail when you go to Rikers Island. Uh, whatever a person get caught for a crime, they ship them to Rikers Island until either they bail out or they go go on trial. Or Rikers Island is where you see your fate. No inmate is on Rikers Island for more than two years. If your trial is that huge of a deal, four years tops. You know, if yeah. you got a lawyer that wants to keep you down there for you know health reasons and other reasons. Other than that, two years of the two years, you're going to find out your faith, whether you're going home or you're going upstate New York to serve out your your, your sentence. Right. So, so it, Rikers Island is what? A barge? It's like a huge barge or is it really an island? It's, it's an island. It's okay. an island. And it's, I thought, it's I thought it was one, like a barge. I thought it was. No, why did I think it was a huge barge? Because they do have break off parts different jails within the city and one of them is in a bronx called the barge it's a, oh, it's okay. a floating it's a floating part is a floating jail that they also house inmates there as well where rikers island get overpopulated so, so so you you got the job you get the call you go down there how, how much do you get any training how much training did you get uh training was about two months and in at, two months at, at they, rikers? no Okay. Training was in a uh, 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 training facility in Queens, and um, what you do there is I'm 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 gonna give you the the professional version and then the right. real version. Professional version: Hey, you're a correction officer. Take the oath. You know, uphold the badge. Uh, this is the do's and don'ts about Rikers Island. Don't do this. Don't do that. We're gonna teach you a little bit. Um, it. I'm not gonna say it's karate. It's just little methods to, to protect yourself because you're going to learn, like, if you're not some kind of black belt or really take training, you're going to have to be able to protect yourself until help arrives. So they just teach you little tactics that what you could do to uh, uh, whatever you're going through to not make it so bad. I mean, to protect yourself for just a while until help comes. So uh, it's a lot of rules and regulations that they teach you uh, in the academy. But now that's the professional part. We're going to teach you everything, all the rules and regulations. Now, the real part is when you become a correction officer and you walk through those gates, forget everything you learned in the academy. You right. forget it because it's not really like that. The academy is, and I found out is, if you do something wrong, we taught you the right way. We already know how you're going to do it once you get there. Right. But we taught you the right way. So now in order to get you in trouble and, and uh, because you were taught the right way. We also know that the right way is not the way that is ran in there, but to cover us 
See, people think the academy is to teach you how to be a correction officer. No, the academy is the blue, the, you know, all the blue paper that says we taught them not to do that. We told them not to do that, not to do this, even though we know in order to run the jail, you got to cut some corners. So, right. Yeah. I was going to say like, um, you know, and it, like the, it, like the medium in the, the feds, they, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's, they don't allow segregation. They don't allow, you know, they don't allow anything like that, but then there, that's the, that's the, the version that you get on the computer. But the truth okay. is all the black guys are, are housed with, or at least in the cells with the black guys, you know, they're sitting mm -hmm. at their own table. They have their own TV. The white guys have their TV. The black guys have a couple TVs because there's more of them. The Hispanics have a TV. Like it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very, you know, they, they naturally segregate themselves. Yeah, but mm -hmm. the COs also, I, I want to say they do encourage it because they realize it keeps the peace. It may yes. not be politically correct, but if you start putting the black guys and the white guys cells and the Hispanic cells and just say, oh, no, no, you're going to go in that cell. Now we've got a problem because now yes. you're, these guys are in danger. They're going to get hurt. They're going to attack each other. They're, you, you know, so it's like I understand what the paperwork says. Mm -hmm. I understand what the rule says. <laughs> yep. But this is going to be a problem. Like you're, you're going to, you might as well take me to the shoe. Or even if this guy doesn't attack me and it doesn't become a problem within a day or two, you know, it's going to be a problem with a lot of times. It'll be a problem with your own people. Yes. So you, you got to get out of that cell. Well, then you got to beat that dude out of that cell. It's like, what mm -hmm. are you talking about, bro? Like I'm here yes. for a tax violation. Like <laughs> I'm not stabbing anybody. What are you talking right? about? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, so I hear, I hear what you're saying. And it's the same thing with this, with the COs, like this might be what happened, but here's what you write on the report. Yes, you know? definitely. A lot of that, a lot of, a lot of, I slipped in the showers. Right. So you, so you, when you do show up, what, what happens? Like, I mean, did you have a, you know, what, what was your plan going in there? Like, Hey, I'm going to work here 20 years and retire or, you know, what? You know I feel it out, you know, my upbringing, I always took jobs that I needed at the time, not jobs that I wanted. Right. Escaping the, escaping the inner city hood. I thought the military was a way out. Mm. So when I came home, like, maybe I could be wrong. I don't recall anybody saying when I grew up, I want to be a correction officer. So, you know, you hear about the benefits of being law enforcement and stuff like that. So. What they do to you when you first get in the academy within that first week, you get your uniform, a lot of boring orientation classes on Monday. That Tuesday, if you start Monday on the, on, on, uh, the academy, that Tuesday, you're on Rikers Island. That Tuesday, they take you to Rikers Island and you, they walk you around Rikers Island. And this is, this is the, your, term of anointment, meaning you look at yourself and, and you decide if you want this job right now, early, before you even go through the academy. They take you and they put you in the worst jail and they let you walk around. It's like a sort of like a tourist attraction. Like you're all lined up there and they, they take you through the cells. They take you to the hardened criminals. And they, um, Have you ever seen a, the Scare Straight program on yeah. TV where they take kids and they let inmates intimidate them and, and say things to them. So that's like your second day in the academy so they can find out if you, true. no, you got to say within yourself if you're going to quit or if you're going to keep this job. Some, a lot of people, like three or four people quit. Like, I'm not doing this, you know? So that's right. how they weed you out to see if, if, if you're going to stay a correction officer. So me being young, I was just taking the job. I, I wanted a job. I wanted to do better for my family. So, you know, it, it, it hit all the marks, benefits, pension, uh, good pay, you know, a couple of, you know, a little bit of hazard with your life. But <laughs> other than that, I, I really didn't have a plan. I just I was just young and let me go and get me a job and see where it takes me. So, so I was, was, was going to say plan. what I don't think I don't think what what people realize, too, is like there's a huge difference between, let's say, a low custody. So I was in in federal prison, right? Like I was in, I did okay. three years in a medium. I did, you know, a year in the U S marshals holdover. It's basically like a, almost like a County jail. Um, mm -hmm. and then I did three years in the medium and then nine years in, um, 
in a low custody, you know, it was a mm-hmm. low security. Prison. So, but, you know, but a, a, a city or a county jail, like you've got, there are very few guys are locked up at Coleman low because they're violent, you know, now there may okay. be violence, you know, in their past, there may be some violence, but there's not a lot. Like, let's say 20, maybe 10% of these guys actually have some kind of violence in their past, you know? Mm. Um, but in County jails, you know, these are, you're getting guys that do home invasions. Uh, they do, you know, carjackings. They do like, these are, like, this is why guys will always say stuff to me in the comments. They're like, they're like, um, Oh, you wouldn't survive in a state prison. You're right. I don't commit state crimes. I don't have to worry about that. Like I'm not concerned. Like I'm filling out paperwork, bro. I'm not mm-hmm. rob. I'm not kicking in somebody's door. I'm not burglarizing a house. Like I'm not concerned about it. But that's my pro- the problem is when these guys talk about most people can think state prison and that there it is. They're violent people. They're vi- a lot of violence yes. in those guys. Yes, I was working I a high classification right. house. Everybody, no, I, can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna be honest with you. First day walking in there, the inmates know you're new. But first oh, yeah, they, you, got they, a, rookie. you got a light blue shirt on, so they already know you got shiny shoes on, so they, they know you're new. And you know what? I'm born and raised in Harlem, a hard projects, polo grounds projects. I'm not saying I'm Mr. Tough Guy, but I've I've seen some things as a kid. Yeah. So now here I am, Marine. I'm a, I'm a Marine. I went through boot camp. I fought in the war. So I, here I'm coming home, six foot three, nine percent body fat. You couldn't tell me I wasn't in, in pretty good shape as a big guy, right, bro? When that door slammed behind me and it, it sunk in, forget all the training, forget all the talking. This is this this is it. You're you're here now. And the horror stories, all that comes back to you, like, okay, there's nothing to protect me but my presentation. Right. That door slammed behind me, and I can hear my heartbeat. I can hear my heartbeat because uh, it, it, it's self-preservation. Like, if, even if you're walking in the street and, you, and you're in a riot, and you got to protect yourself against 30 guys, like, right. realistically speaking, Bruce Lee, I don't, the toughest of the toughest. You're not going to protect yourself from 30 guys and all that mentally comes to play like, you know, okay, am I, I'm here, that door slammed. And then you know, the rules and regulations that you're my partner, but you're, you're the A officer. I'm the B officer. They got to be inside with the inmates walking around, making sure they're not hanging themselves up and uh, raping one another and beating one another up. Dude, I'm only one man, you know? So Mm -hmm. I had to learn that a lot of prisons and jail, the consequence, the consequences of their actions keep them in check. Meaning, yeah, you could beat me up. You can do what you want to, but you know you're not going away. So you know after you beat yeah. me up, kill me, you do whatever you want, you know you're pretty much done. So that's the logic behind two officers to a hundred inmates. They right. know you momentarily you may have a victory if you beat up an officer or whatever the case may be, but you know it's coming. And do you want to catch the wrath of what's coming? So that's what stops a lot of inmates from doing things. But I was terrified, bro. You, I, I was terrified. I didn't think I was, I didn't think I was built because before that I wasn't a criminal. No, right. I wasn't. So, so yeah, I was gonna say you're saying a retaliation. Like the the inmates would always say, well, you know, they can't retaliate. <laughs> you're fucking out of your mind, bro. Like yes. you, 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 you can smart off to an officer and. Five minutes later, you walk in your cell. He's got, he's opened up your locker. Your shit's everywhere. He's throwing contraband, 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 contraband. He's just throwing stuff in a, in a bag. And you're like, oh man, even if he says it's not contraband, I'm never getting it back. Yes. You know, well, you could fill out a BP this or fill out a BP that, or, you know, they have mm-hmm. these forms and you're like, yeah. you're never, you're never seeing anything. Even if you win, you're not getting anything like at all. you're at their mercy. You can't win. So it's just. Instead, they just take it out on each other. Um, you, you're absolutely right. And I'm glad you said that because a lot of people don't understand. You can hate law enforcement all you want to. You can hate the cops. The cops, the police officers outside. You you got more of a leverage with cameras and stuff like that. When you become an inmate as a correction officer, I decide whether you right. live or die. I, I decide that. 
you know, and I, you know, you don't think you have to kiss nobody ass, and you got, oh, can you curse on this thing? Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you know, you might think I'm a man, and I'm not gonna bow down to this that. Listen, you piss off the right officer. I've, I've seen worse revenge tactics. Yeah. Than ripping up your your legal paperwork that you worked so hard to get that that could have your freedom in your in your hand. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, they don't understand that their life is in uh, the correction officer's hand. Yeah, I um, yeah, I don't think I ever, I never wrote anything up. I never because I knew it's just not going to. In the end, it's not going to go your way. Mm-hmm. I'll buy another one. I'll order. I'll call my lawyer and get them to send in some more paperwork. I'll I'll get another one from commissary. I'll, you know, and, and I would listen. I'm polite to everybody. I'm polite. You could, I, I would say, you know, I could. I could have lunch with with uh, Stalin and Adolf Hitler, and I would be perfectly nice. Oh, how's it going? Yeah, what's uh, yeah? That didn't work out, you know. Um, so yeah, I was always nice. Um, I never had any problems uh, with, with any of the officers either. But then again, the thing is, in the feds, you, you almost never see them. You know, once you get to prison, you have very little uh, uh, communication or, or contact with the uh, with the COs. It, it's where in you know, that there's like one officer for every 300 and some odd, uh, mm-hmm. you know, guys. So, and, and honestly, they're, they're pretty well behaved because everybody's got their, they get their routine. The problem is, is that like the jail that you're in, like these guys are all, they're just sitting in their cells for playing cars. They're just boredom is killing them. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's, it's, it's so, so what happened? So you're working what 40 hours a week. How mm-hmm. long, you know, how long are you working until things till, somebody approaches you or how does that, how does that happen? Okay. Around. And cause I can't speak for other cities. I can only talk about Rikers Island. Uh, when they put the posting up or they, or they put it out there, advertise that they're hiring. You take the test, you get the job, but however, you're living in the same neighborhoods as these criminals. Right. Are. So now they tell you in the academy, you're going to see people you know. There's no way around it. Now, it's kind of awkward because the rules and regulations of the academy, of the academy once you become a correction officer, no interactment with anybody who has no felons. You can't be hanging out with felons, even your family member. You can't be. A guy got in trouble one time going to his cousin's wedding, and he's in the, the wedding photo. You know, the wedding party takes a picture. They found out about it, asked him, like, why do you know this guy is a known felon and you're he's way on the end of the picture. You're, you're in here with this with this person. So when they say you get approached, it's people in your neighborhood that get arrested. And they see you, you know, them, right, you know, them. like, I'm going to be honest with you. One of one of the stories I have to tell you is that um, I beat up my best friend. I beat up my best friend for the sake that he was an inmate and I'm an officer. This is how close proximity that you know people. So now if I know you, I know your mom, they go to church together. We went we to high school together, played on the basketball team together. If I need a cigarette, if I need drugs, you know me. Right. You know, so to speak. So I'm going to test your loyalty to that badge versus your loyalty to us as kids coming up. You know, maybe I saved your butt a time or two when we were getting jumped by various gangs and robbers. So, you know, because you go through things as a kid in high school with people who you took the right path, you became an officer, and they took the wrong path and they're inmate. Right. You know, and they know you and they feel, okay, if you may just say, okay, I'll bring you something there on a strip that my mom and your mom go to church together. Right. You know, yeah, so I, I was going to say it's impossible to separate them. Like in, in um in Coleman, if you like, I there was a guy, a buddy of mine, one time who saw an officer that he knew, like it was a friend of his brother's, and the officer when he saw him, he kind of waited a little bit, and then when he got when he was not you know in like a visible place, he went up to him, he said, "Bro, don't tell anybody that you know me." He said, "They're gonna because they'll ship you immediately." Yes, because this is a prison. This is you know, and and so another time I was at the medium, and there was a guy who went to high school with a, the correction, a, a female correctional officer. And mm-hmm. this guy, in, he's in her office at, she's letting him out after count. They're talking, he's sitting on their desk. And I remember my, my cousin was locked up with me and he came up, he goes, how long do you think that's going to last? I said, I don't know how long, what do you think is, oh, he goes, he's gone in a week. 
He's got, he was, I'm surprised he's not gone already. Sure enough, he's on the pack out like two days later. He doesn't have, and yeah. he's like, well, I don't understand. And everybody's going, what are you doing? Like, what did you think? Like, you didn't even try and hide it, bro. Mm -hmm. You're telling everybody, oh, he, she ain't going to say nothing. The inmates will say something. Yes. But in, in the, in, in, in Rikers, like there's just no way to, you, you couldn't keep officers or, or the inmates. You have nowhere to sh ship them. You have, just have to it, deal with it. You know what? It's too many. Right. You know, too many people. Okay. Here, here's the rule. If it's, it's not so much, if you know someone, but definitely if they were a family member, you definitely got to let people know and they got to get out of here. You can't ship off everybody, you know, right. You got to pull them to the side. And check them. And when I say check them, you got to make sure that they know if they violate what you tell them, that you will get them hurt up or you will right. put the beats on them. So now, OK, I know your mom. OK, we went to school together, but this is my job. And I'm right. telling you, I'm going to do my job. Right. So a lot of times, once you put it in that perspective, very little people become hard headed. Now they they will they will um go back and call people, oh you know Gary's in here and he's acting like an officer. Like he should. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know like he's like he's a they, police or something. Yes. Right. Yes, because but you know, I'm I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm guilty of uh seeing friends, helping out friends, you know, while I was there. I, it sometimes it's human nature. You know, but you you generally you don't want to jeopardize your livelihood. You got this job for a reason. I'm, bro, I'm sorry that you took a left when I took a right. I'm sorry you ended up on that side of the fence. But if you really are my friend. Right. And our, our parents, you know, our, our family are intertwined like that. You will respect what I'm doing. Now, I'm not going to go out my way to do you bodily harm. But in the line of work, I, that happened to me. I, right. I, I had to beat up one of my friends because it's my job. It's my job. So that was, that's a hard thing to do to come back to the neighborhood after you um, put the beats down on, on one of your friends. Everybody knows, everybody because everybody's family is right there in close proximity. So yeah, that's, that's that's tough. That's a tough part about being a, being a um, correction officer. But guess what? You got to remember, you took this job to get away from all that. Right. I was going to say how long that doesn't have to take, but a few years of dealing with that. And now I can move out of this area. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So yeah, I had a guy on, uh, um, I interviewed a guy, whatever, uh, yesterday, actually, and he was talking about like the different, he lives in Florida now, but he grew up, um, in New York. And he's like, you don't understand. Like you, like you see these guys all the time. He's like, it's not like in Florida. I can bump into somebody in the mall in Florida and have an issue with the guy and never see him again. He's like, that's mm. not what he's in New York. You're going to see this guy, yes. even if he lives four blocks away, multiple times yes. in the next month. So yeah, I can, I can only imagine how many people you must have known. So at, at what point, you know, at what point, like how many years go by before you kind of cross that line? Uh, I was roughly a correction officer like two years because what, what happened, I mean, what happened was in the military, me and uh, my wife was on shaky terms when I was already in the, in the Gulf War, in, right. in the war. So coming home was kind of like, let's try to make this work type of thing. And being a correction officer, coming in with a shaky marriage <laughs> is the wrong thing to do. So. Evidently, she we we found no divorce and child support set in. I, I think I had been a correction officer for like two years. Child support set in. Shredded my check, destroyed me. You know, uh, I had my own apartment. Car got repoed. Had to move back in with mom. All of that went down. Now, up until that time, I I think I was a pretty solid officer, meaning. I saw, saw a couple of people, a lot of people from my neighborhood who probably, hey, can you bring me this? Can you bring me that? And no, no, I would shut them down. No, 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 no. You know, but that don't stop them from today. Monday, you said no. Friday, you may say, yeah, they're going to ask you all the time. They're going to test you all the time. Right. So up until that point, I was pretty solid until I started getting my paycheck after all the deductions and the rears from child support. And, and the opportunities were still there for me 
to be corrupt. Right. You know, so um, I remember the first time I did it. Terrified. Uh, like if I know you, right, I know you don't smoke cigarettes. I know right. you don't drink. So nobody can't walk up to me and tell me, hey, yo, I saw Duke down smoking a blunt and drinking some Hennessy on the corner. Oh, come on. I know him. So now Mayor Giuliani stopped cigarettes in all city agencies throughout the city. And guess what? The jails are city agencies. So right. in commissary, they had to stop selling cigarettes. So if you came to jail and you 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 were a smoker, you better get that patch. You better get some kind of whatever you're going to need. So that opened up a very lucrative opportunity to make money. At the time, a pack of cigarettes wasn't even 10 bucks at the time. Now, you know, you get 25 cigarettes, 15 cigarettes in a pack. One cigarette, you got to learn. I mean, you probably know. They'll yeah. take that cigarette, break it down into about three cigarettes called Rollies. And if you're a smoker, you'll pay up to $20 for one of those Rollies. $20, and I, I don't know about any other jail. When you go to come and say a bag of chips is 10 cents, sodas is a quarter. So you were living like a, a king off of $20 in your commissary. So now you have a whole pack of cigarettes to do what they call juggling. I mean, it's like trading for sneakers, trading for stuff that because people want to smoke that bad. Right. So when once he put the, it's called quality of life uh, laws in effect. And now nobody can smoke in the city buildings. So even if you work in the corporate America and you work in the city building, you got to go downstairs outside in the cold, smoke your cigarette. So that opened up the door for me. And I remember the first time. Uh, I just want to put it out there for all officers who think that uh, you're going to get away with it, bro. There's no smooth way about it. Sooner or later, you're going to get caught. Now, I bring a, a pack of cigarettes, supposedly the surefire way, somebody from my neighborhood who I do. I know his family. So I really didn't think he was going to snitch on me or get me in trouble. And I needed the money. So I bought Tops Tobacco. At the time, a pouch of Tops Tobacco cost like $2. Gave me 300 bucks. I spent $2. It's a nice profit. Bucks. So, but... If you know me, like you, my boy, you know me. And I'm, I come in there, I'm sweating, my forehead's sweating in my mind. He knows, he, he knows I have something yeah. on me. My heart, he, everybody's looking at me because they know I have something. Now, in hindsight, it's a, it's a, it's a cigarette. So it's not a, a drug or, or nothing like that. And I could be using it for personal use. But if you know I don't smoke cigarettes, if you see me with a cigarette, like what the hell are you doing with a cigarette inside the jail? you right so all this is playing in my mind as i'm walking through the the it's called the magnomina where they search all because everybody's supposed to get searched but guess what if you my boy and we play ball together we just came from the next game nobody's searching me you know what i'm saying you might be dating my sister i mean this is how close we are so and nobody's gonna think gary is bringing in contraband right so uh and i had to because i already got paid the 300 dollars. i already got the, i get the money first and then I told him I would bring it. So I'm taking all the precautions. I'm wiping off the the the, the pack. Of, the, you're not gonna find no fingerprints from me on this cigarette if he get caught with these this pouch of tobacco. So I stuff it in my vest. I come in fully dressed in my correctional officer uniform, and I walk right through. And you know I'm talking smack about the basketball game, and and uh, I'm sweating. They don't see I'm nervous as hell. Cause I'm a clown now. Normally, you know, jovial, cracking jokes. I'm dead serious. Let me get to my housing area to get this thing off me. Right. So uh, they have something called muster where we all sit there. And it's like attendance. Uh, John, you here. Gary, you here. Chuck, you here. All the while, everything is moving in slow motion, bro. It's moving in slow motion because I've never done nothing like this before, but I was desperate. So I get to my housing area. Now there's other. There's another officer there that I got to wait for the opportunity. So all this is it's really all this takes about a half hour, but it's an eternity when you really know you're doing wrong. Yeah. You really know you're doing wrong. So I see the inmate, I let him out of his cell, right? To clean up. 
He's cleaning up. So the officer goes to the bathroom. At that time, the officer goes to the bathroom. This is when cameras wasn't everywhere. They didn't have no cameras. So I quickly took it out of my vest and I gave it to him and he went to his cell. Now I'm clear. Unless there's a camera, unless there's forensics with the fingerprints, I'm clear. But in my mind, he's going to tell. Somebody's going to say something. They're going to jump under the, from under this desk, behind the door. Somebody's just waiting for me to give them that tobacco. And at the end of the day, when nobody jumped out and said nothing, nobody jumped out the trunk of my car. When I got home, nobody was waiting at my door saying, aha, we got you. And I breathed a sigh of relief and I held that 300 bucks in my hand. Uh, that, was, that was the turning point. Right. That, was, thought, the turning thought, point. that was easy. I can do that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I said, and I, I did. And I, I the did same that. Way. Every time yeah. I got away with something, I became mm -hmm. emboldened by it. I felt like I'm good at this. Like, yes. Like, you think you're good. Yeah. Yeah. No, it just hadn't no. caught up with you. Mm hmm. Um, how did that guy. So you're saying they're asking you all the time. Just finally, one day you just said, yeah, all right. That was it. Well, like they, he just yeah. Approached yeah you when they're asking you, you tell them, no, get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Right. So some officers they look like, okay, he's never going to break. But in the academy, they tell you if you bring him a stick of gum, a stick, a stick of bubble gum, you bring him in a gun. Yeah. That's what they yeah. tell you, you know, meaning these inmates got nothing but time to sit here and study you. They Extremely study you. Manipulative. Me, I, I, I come in, I tell you, yeah, me and my old lady having problems. I'm getting divorced. I, I, I got to pay taxes. My son is this, that. But I, I'm telling you my whole business. Mm -hmm. Their ears is to the Oppor wall. Opportunity. Yes. yes. So when they're asking you, um, let, let them hear you going through divorce and that you pay. Or I'm telling you, I leave and you're talking crap about me. And you tell my buddy, yes, yeah, old lady taking them to the cleaners, whatever. They prey on stuff like that. Right. You know, and when, so as an officer, I know who, uh, propositioned me so when 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 it got real bad for me i know who to go to right to 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 to, to, to get it done and that's what i did you know so once you paid or once you got you brought that contraband in how long was it before you did something else or you know at that point you realized okay i can do this period i'll do it every once in a while yes that's how it goes right i'll do it i, I was only doing it like when I needed it, I need three or 400 bucks. I make a deal. Boom. And then it got to, it got bad. It got really bad. So I was bringing in like about, I'm going to tell you a story. I, I had like 20 pouches of tobacco. See, I'm a big guy and correction officers. They have this vest. It's like a bulletproof vest, but it's a staff food vest for correction officers. So uh, uh, with me being a big guy and then wearing the bulky vest, you're not going to search my vest. So I would take the inserts out of the vest and stuff them with tobacco and go to my housing area. Now, good thing. Well, I'm going to say, listen, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, I'm just going to tell you because I was I in the hear you. you don't, you don't have to, I hear you. <laughs> okay. Here it is. They corrections try different tactics to, to catch officers bringing contraband inside the jail. Right. So one time I'm coming through with them 20 pouches of tobacco and I see a friend of mine and I'm like, we went, we was in the correction academy together. His name was Klein. Hey, Klein, what's going on? But I, I'm talking to him. And then it hit me. Klein got the, got promoted to the canine unit. So I'm looking at Klein leaning up on a desk. But under the desk where you can't see is this, is this canine dog that sniffs for drugs. Right. So if you were to come by and he smelled drugs, that dog would react. I didn't have drugs. I had right. tobacco. So I noticed that. And I said, oh, in my mind, holy crap. You know. Yeah. But now I get to my housing area. Uh, you know, we all like family. We all like friends. So I get a phone call from security. Listen, the search is coming to your housing area. The search is when periodically 10 to 15 officers get together and they go to a housing area and search for contraband, weapons, and stuff like that to shake the inmates up. Yeah. So, so shake I got down. the phone. Yeah. The shakedown so crew. Phone call. 
that they're coming to do a shakedown in, in my area. Here I am. I got 20 pouches of tobacco and I just had gave an inmate five pouches. I hurried up and took my pouches and put it in the ceiling in my office. They never searched the office the station. Right. So they went in on house and in, in, in inside the housing area. And I know I just gave this guy pouches of tobacco. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at them search inmate by inmate. And they're getting closer and closer to the guy I gave the tobacco to. So what I did was I jumped into action. I went out and joined the search to help them search the inmates. So I went to the guy I know was dirty with tobacco and I yelled at him and I got aggressive with him and I pat him down and I threw him inside his cell and told him to close cell number 18. So they're looking at me like I'm helping them with the search. Right. But in all honesty, I'm getting me and this guy right. out, of, out of trouble. You know what I'm saying? God forbid if they say, no, nah, forget that. We're going to search him anyway. I'd have been dead. I'd right. have been dead in the water. So that was one of my scary, one of my scary moments. No. Were you was your concern that he's going to get caught and then he's going to flip and when they say where'd you get this he's going to say man listen you know yes. that that yes, was your that concern was, that you know hey, you know Hayward gave it to me you know that that's what he's going to mm -hmm. say yes that's what, but then again these guys not in, uh, intelligence is not dumb even if he didn't say that um, when you catch an inmate with contraband it's normally wrapped in a balloon or it's normally wrapped in something that you know they secrete. And they behind something like that. So to have a fresh pouch of tobacco, like he just bought it from the corner store. Yeah, you're. It's one of the guards brought it in. That's, that's it. in this housing in this housing unit, and that's very comfortable with doing it. Like you did it more than once for you to for us to catch it that fresh. So even though they really couldn't prove it, if he kept his mouth shut, even though they really couldn't prove it, of course now they're gonna watch you. Now, now they're on you. Now you're exposed. So that's that day went by smooth. You said 20, 20 pouches? Yes. At, at, at 300, 300, that's yeah. six grand. Yes. Wow. Well, you we got well, what what happened with me is I had a first of all, I'm not trying to put my vices on any correction officer. I I drunk a lot. Due to stress from the job and stress from going on through, through I, I'm not making no excuses. I'm just telling you the reality. And I had a gambling problem. I had to shoot dice with the best of them. So those two combined with not having any money was a recipe for a disaster. So I can go in a gambling spot and win five, six grand right. or lose five, six grand. But, and with no worries, because I know I could go to the jail and get that back. So not good. That it's not good. It it, it 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 was terrible. But when you when I'm in it, when I'm living it, uh, it it justified the means yeah. when I was in it. You know. Does anybody, um. Does anybody on the street, because by now you're divorced. Yes. You're, you're seeing your kid periodically. I'm assuming your, your uh, wife got uh, custody. Yes. yes. So you're seeing, you're seeing your son. Is it a uh, son, right? My son and daughter. Okay. You're seeing your son and daughter, everyone, uh, you know, whatever, you know, the, you know, a few times a week. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a girlfriend at this point? Uh, you, you know, I had a couple of girlfriends, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm young. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm still, you could be broke, right? But as long as you got this badge and run around the hood with a gun, yeah. there's going to be somebody willing to be with you, right? You know, at all times. So, are you still? Do you have your own place now? Or you're still hanging out at your? Well, I'm in between. I got, I got, I still live with my mom's, but now I have a, a female friend that, I, that I'm living with, and now the money, the money is coming in because now, I um. I used to make a lot of trips with tobacco to make money. Right. But then once I started doing other things like bringing in cell phones, if it, were, if it was an inmate's birthday, I would, uh, you know, those airport little nips of liquor that they, they yeah. give you at the airport? The single serving size. Yeah. Yes. Guess what? $500. Wow. 
fucking ridiculous. It's your birthday. Your mom, your mom wants to do something for your birthday. Either she'll give me five hundred dollars, or listen, I'm gonna tell you, I was a piece of shit because I was. I, I'm in. I'm in. I'm in this life. So if your mom didn't have my whole five hundred dollars, she could always uh, supplement payment in various ways, and right. and for five hundred dollars, I would bring the little nip of liquor, put it in an iced tea uh, bottle, lock you in your cell because come on. Everybody who don't smoke weed, if you're not a weed smoker, you can smell that 10 blocks away. Nobody in there got liquor, so they're going to smell liquor right. in there. So my thing is, the agreement is, if I bring this to you, you got to lock in for the day. Now, you'll lock in for your birthday. You'll be drunk, you know, and you enjoy your birthday. Happy birthday. You know, Does, I got 500 bucks. You got a little sip of liquor. You know, your... Does your your girlfriend that you're with, does she know what's going on? Does anybody on no. the street know what's going on? No, nobody. Guess, guess what? I'm going to tell you. And, you know, one of the things, one of the hardest things for me during this whole ordeal was to tell my mom, look her in the face and tell her that I'm guilty. Because, you know, your mom don't believe you. Your mom's going to fight the whole world for you. I know. She writing the governor. They framed him. My mom. I had to tell her. That I was guilty. Now, the image that I had was Gary joined the Marines. He's a decorated war veteran. And now he's a correction officer. Right. So only a few people where I went to the gambling spot knew that I was a CEO because um they they would these guys were in and out of jail. So they would see me in the jail and then they would see me on the on the street. Now, some people didn't know that I was a correction officer. Because when you're a correction officer, your hours rotate every week. It's something called the wheel. One week, you're 7 to 3. Next week, you're 3 to 11. Next week, you work at midnights. So at different times, I would be in the gambling spot during the day, during the night, this and that. So nobody knew. And I had money. So a lot of people didn't know that I was a correction officer. I was getting my pay. Well, my pay wasn't really anything but due to child support. But my other activities... And then I would do overtime to make up for the money that I was losing. So I, I was making pretty decent money. So uh, nobody really knew what I was doing until I got busted. I was on the front page of the, uh, of the local newspaper. That's when the holy crap. Then people thought I knew it because they was like, I knew correction officers didn't make that kind of money that you were spending. So, yeah. So uh, it's like uh, um, uh, Mike McDowell has had uh, multiple businesses. He's driving a brand new Corvette. It's like, what are you doing? You're a yes. police officer. It, at the, and at that time when he was a cop, he was a corrupt cop in New York. Like cops weren't making anything like, what, what's, like obviously you're doing something. So yes. Um, what I was going to say is, so how did it like, how did you, how did it progress from you're thinking it's just tobacco and then it becomes a cell phone? Like, did you think, did so, you think, uh, like um, anybody who's doing crime, I mean, you get away, you get away with it for a couple of times. You think you invented the wheel. You think you covered your ass where nobody's going to lead back to you. Nobody, and you got people in place that are trustworthy now because y'all don't make money together. So, uh, like a businessman, you supply and demand. People uh, they were putting clamps down, tapping inmate phone calls, stuff like that. Uh, of course, you know, inmates, well, inmates are not supposed to be having sex in, in jail. So what happened with me is I kind of became like a businessman, supply and demand. I, I seen a need, whatever they needed. I found a way to get it to them safely. Meaning I, I would have people West at the time, Western Union me, the, the money. Right. Right. And it was a female correction officer that was willing. A willing participant. Now, I'm going to tell you something funny. A reporter read my book and did an article in the paper, a full spread, how I bring in liquor, cooch, tobacco, cocaine, and prostituted female correction officers. Right. That, If you look at it, maybe I did, but not prostitution like, like you would say. I'm, when I look at prostitution, it's like, okay, I'm going to beat you up if you don't go in there and service this guy and give me the money. 
Right. To me, that's prostituting and pimping women. Yeah. If the female is is willing, and I'm just protection, I'm not forcing her to do anything. She just paying me to make sure she's okay. And what it is when when I was corrupt, I knew the real guys in there that made made a lot of money on the street. So I knew they would pay. So she when, when the, this is another thing, correction officers, if you're out there doing doing bad, inmates are going to talk regardless. If yeah. they got a correction officer in their pocket, that gives them status. So if you think that they they're just going to be quiet and you know y'all gonna have this thing going for a hundred million years, no, it's not gonna happen. So once she got wind of what I was doing, she propositioned me because what, the way it went is I knew the guys that was doing stuff. She got time. She got because a lot of times guy would you know image would lie to her. Yeah, my family, I make a lot of money in the street, and then when she would service them, she'd come up short. So the way it worked was uh, they wanted to have sex. She was willing to have sex. Fifteen hundred a pop. I get five hundred. She gets a, a grand and she did it like two or three times a week. How does that conversation go between you and the inmate and you uh-huh. and her? Okay. First of all, it has to be an inmate that I I'm already working with. Right. No new guy out the random this and that. So of course any inmate wants sex from, from no, you know, if they, if they can afford it. Yeah. So we're we're making money. Guys are are, are paying their lawyers with money that we're we're making in right. there. And so once I you know I got wind that he had the money and he wanted it to, it to happen, what I would do was I would get the money, give her her grand, take my five hundred in the morning when nobody's there but me on post. She would come, take care of him. In a, in a utility closet, because remember, at the time, ain't no cameras all over the place. Right. And she would take but, care of them. And you have to figure out a way to get both these people at the same place. And inmates don't have, they don't have the run of the facility. They have, they can only go some places, some. An officer can take an inmate. Anywhere? Wherever. Yeah. When I first became an officer, and it was, you know, gung-ho, I'm going to be the best CO ever. It was a female that would come in my housing area that didn't work my housing area. It was an inmate called Divine. I'm not gonna call no grown man Divine, but he's he, he was Divine. He has silk sheets and satin shirts because you got to remember in Rikers Island, until you get convicted, you wear your own clothes. Really? No, only when you go upstate and become and go to prison, yeah. you get the greens that everybody wear the same thing. Right. Rikers Island, you going back and forth, you got to have your own clothes, sneakers, whatever. And this guy had alligator shoes, expensive shoes, and silk pants and sheets on his bed and all that kind of stuff. And nobody ever went in his cell to challenge him, to test him or anything. And this female would come get him and walk him around the jail. And I'm new. So every, that means now in hindsight, all these other officers knew about this guy on the, on the street. He, do, he was somebody. Right. So she would come and you know, certain inmates had certain privileges. So now when I'm running my housing area, and if me and the female know what's going on, there's nobody else there. So I would let the inmate out, tell him to go and sweep and mop over here, or go get the supplies and do this and that. When he would come out, she would service him, send him back to send him back up. Like it, it, it didn't, it wasn't a marathon. Right. So it was easy for her to take care, of, and it was easy fifteen hundred bucks. So. And, and I and this is a a, a very um, superficial thing for me to say. Okay. And ask you, what this chick look like? Uh, it's not a superficial because you know better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying. I mean, I'm sure she was. I mean, I mean, I'm you know maybe maybe she had a great personality or something. I don't know, but you know because okay. Please, this is my disclaimer. I'm not saying all female correction officers, right? But throughout my 13 years dealing with the prison system, it they're a rough bunch. Yes, it's, 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 Listen, I've it, only and the inmates know. I've seen two that I thought, man, sh- I'd I I'd nail her on the street, bro. Like yeah. I've only seen two. Yeah, in 13 now, I'm years. A, I'm gonna be honest with you. 
On Rikers Island, I can say there was a, a lot of fine female seals, but none of them fit the criteria of selling a body. Right. To a to a to an image. So when you ask you about them, it, please forgive me. It's the <laughs> it's the you do know it's the not so great lookers, the low so because inmates play on these females that got low self-esteem, bro. Right. I've seen a female wait for an inmate to get out of prison and and be with him. Right? Now me and you, me and you men, like I think. I could be wrong. Any ugly female out here can get sex with somebody. Somebody will definitely go to your house where nobody can see and meet you somewhere where nobody knows that we together. So it's not to me. I think it's no such thing as a female that can't get sex. But with these inmates, they play on you. They see you low. They see that you. I'm just gonna say they see that you're ugly. They see you get low self esteem. They tell you you're beautiful. They treat you like you're the best thing that ever happened. And, and, and guess what? If you're not getting those compliments, if you're not getting that kind of attention out in the street, you easy pickings. These inmates ain't got nothing but time. I'm going to tell you what they used to do. If they knew a certain female were coming, coming to work, we plotting. We all plotting. So we'll get Josh, who's the guy who works out. You can see all his muscles, six pack and everything. And he got a penis about a, a foot long. Now, if he goes up and flashes a female officer, he knows he's gonna get his ass beat and he's going to the hospital. He, he knows right. that. But if he, one of our, one of our duties is, you know, checking the MA cells, looking in that window, making sure the MA ain't hanging himself or doing something right. that he's not supposed to be doing. So when she's making her rounds, everybody know they'll tap the wall, they give the signal, she's coming. So he would accidentally, right, be sleeping with his Johnson out. Right. Right. And she would come and accidentally see his Johnson. She may be on the wall. Hey, cover yourself up. Oh, I'm sorry, CO. I didn't know I was sleeping. So now he's not in trouble, but she's not going to forget that I saw this guy's thing. Right. Throughout the next throughout time, if she's giving him special privileges, if he she don't allow nobody to talk to her, now he's having conversations with her. So now everybody's putting him up there. See if you could bring she'll bring us this. She, so they're all plotting. They're yeah. all plotting. And it's going to be to the time where if she really, if he really gets in her head, she's going to have sex with him. Yeah. She's going to make a way. So now this individual, because it, it, it was a couple of females that was with it throughout my career, you know, and besides their correction also pay, some of them making two or three grand a week. And you can always tell because they blow themselves up because all of a sudden they got nice cars, nicer cars, and they come in with mink coats on and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, when in hindsight, when you sit back and look and you know the 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 the, the lay of the land, you know. So, yeah. Um. <laughs> so, what about cell phones? Like, how, how what does a cell phone go go for? Um. At the time, they had these little small small phones like this. Yeah. Flip, a flip phone that I'm going to be honest with you, that is easy for an inmate to boof inside his behind. Right. To regulate that, they had calling cards where you could buy 10 minutes worth of time, 15 minutes worth of time. So depending on the, the situation, how bad you want to talk to somebody that don't, and your lawyer, and you don't want to use the, the Rikers Island phone, uh, I'd be easy on you. 250 to 500. You know, I, I give you the phone. You get 10 minutes to talk to whoever you want to talk to. You bring my phone back until the next time somebody wants to use it. Oh, I mean, okay. at so this time, I, I was running like I was running my organization like it was a business. Cell phone, liquor, this and that. So, I mean, it sounds crazy, but it's not further from the truth. So you're keeping the phone. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had an inmate one time try to keep the phone. And I had to put a hit out on Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> what do you mean? How, how, what do you mean a hit? Like, listen, this is what it is, right? Once you establish yourself and you're doing dirt, I'm going to say doing dirt. Nobody, no inmate wants that messed up. So if somebody right. comes along and it's just like if you're doing selling drugs in the street, don't be shooting and killing nobody because then you're going to bring the cops here and it's bad for business. So it's the same thing in the jail. Don't be fighting and cutting and stabbing because we got a good thing going right here. And anybody who steps out of line, I don't even have to say anything. So when I say I put a hit out on them, I just let it be known that, listen, if I don't get my phone back by the end of the day, 
is going to be a problem. And the way things happen, if, uh, forget me being corrupt. Day to day basis, if inmates fight to prevent them from fighting, you may have 30, 30 inmates, two of them get into a fight. When us as a squad coming in, we smacking and beating down everybody because these two individuals fought. Right. And that's that's the way it was. So this prevented anybody. Who, you know what's going to happen now if I beat an inmate up because he didn't have nothing to do with your argument when I leave. Yeah, when, he's when I'm not there, it's, it's, it's another problem. I was so, going to say, you can always just go and say, look, I'll just go. I'm just going to pick 10, 10 cells randomly and I'm going to find something from every one of you guys and I'm going to take it until I get my shit back. And they'll, you know, and all you look like you're doing is I'm just doing my job. I'm shaking. Down randomly. It. I'm supposed to shake down so many cells a day mm -hmm. and so, I have two or three guys that I know I'm going to get something good. They're going to be mm -hmm. upset. When he didn't give me back my phone, needless to say, I had a bunch of sneakers screeching and, and scratching and going on and I got my phone back. Right. And he went to the clinic. So what are you making a month doing this? Um, I couldn't pinpoint. I think at one time I had about, I have, cause guess what? I, I very rarely did I have to take my own money out the bank. So I had my, right. my, my check direct deposit. So I was living off what I was doing in the street. So at one time I could say I had about 40, 40,000, uh, 40,000 sitting on my bed stacked up. And it was various different times because I was losing a, a lot of money gambling, making it back, splurging. So I can't just say, oh, definitely I made this amount. But I I, I made pretty decent money. I had more than a couple of cars. You know, to me, I was living the life of a drug dealer that was out in the street. So I was law enforcement. Right. So well, uh, the money came and it went. So yeah. how often, like not how often, but were there any times that the, I don't, I don't, I, I don't want to say upper echelon, but basically like the, I don't know what, I don't know what the ranks are in, in the state, but it's like the lieutenants, the, mm -hmm. the warden, the assistant warden that, you know, yes. and I don't know, you know, in, in federal prison, let, let's say they know stuff's going on. Mm -hmm. but if it becomes blatant, then they have to, they have to investigate it, find somebody, and then they have to act extremely offended. I can't believe you would do this. It'd be like, come on, stop, bro. You know this is happening. So I'm saying, Ed, were there any investigations that came close to you, and, but you skated uh, the investigation or it, it, it didn't, or it, nothing happened until boom, it just came down? Nothing happened until boom, but I had somebody in security, right? Tell me that word on the street is no, I'm gonna tell you what happened one time. Well, I okay. think the investigation on me started. You had the Latin Kings and the Bloods about to fight in the mess hall. So we had all the officers gearing up, putting on riot gear, about to go and try to defuse something that's about to happen. So me, just being who I am, walked into the mess hall in the middle of all this hostility that was going back and forth between his blacks and Hispanics. As soon as I walk in there, everybody calms down. Everybody calms down. Everybody goes and sit down and to their, at their table. I'm unaware of what was going on before I got there. So there's a captain that turns and look at me. And she says, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm Officer Hayward, you know, I'm also Gary Hayward, blah, blah, blah. And she said, no, who are you? And when she asked me that, I, I, I got a chill because it's the same question, but I know what she's getting at because now these inmates are like, hey, hey what's up, Hayward? How you doing? Hey, inmates say, I don't know. Right. Hey, what's up, Hayward? So now I know somebody's yapping. Somebody's talking. The gig, in my mind, the gig is up at that point. So then... Months would go by, and then a guy was like talking crap, like uh, security don't know what they're talking about. You know, they talking about if, if you want to get rid of all the drugs in the jail, get rid of Haywood. You know that that yeah, it got like that. So I I chilled out. Right. Right. Uh, 
I so chilled wait, out to the. Wait a second, hold on. So at this point, you're you're also bringing in drugs. You're bringing what yes. marijuana? What is it? Everything or are you just? I'm, I'm bringing in. I'm bringing in. The only thing I didn't bring in was I didn't bring in no weapons because I didn't want my housing area hot. Matter because the housing area I was in, if you were in the newspaper, you were in my housing area. Okay. Mad mad bodies, drug kingpins, all kind of violence and stuff. I had the highest classification house on, you know, in, in the jail it called eight upper. So um, these are all high profile guys. Yes. Yes. I remember the time the stalker that stalked Serena Williams, the tennis player, right? They, they arrested him and he was on the front page of the paper. The inmates knew he was coming to how I was in there. As soon as he walked in in there, they put the tennis on TV to torture him. <laughs> they, 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 <laughs> so once I, I felt that, that the gig, gig gig was up, I tried to escape. When I tried to escape, I put in for a transfer to go to another jail. I'm going to start anew, you know, because in the height of what I was doing, I was bringing in cell phones, liquor, weed, and crack cocaine. And I kind of knew that I wasn't the only officer doing it. That's how I elevated from from weed and cigarettes, an inmate came and told me, listen, over there on the north side, they getting it over there. I'm like, what do you mean getting it? He said, they getting it. They, you know, they got coke. And then he showed me a, a sample of what was, so I'm like, oh, I got competition. Now at this time, nothing ever dawned on me that you're going to get caught. My, my, listen, I have my workers. I have my workers that work the staff kitchen. I have my workers that work the Muslim service. I have my workers that work the gym, that work the yard. So I have people going and coming and it worked like clockwork. And guess what? To the point where I really didn't have to touch nothing per se and made, right. made money. So you, you think you're untouchable. And of course, don't forget, I got the shield and my integrity and I'm off to say, hey, what? How dare you accuse right. me? <laughs> you, you know, so. Um. We, we were at we were at uh, the uh, the chow hall. There was an issue. The one officer, and then yes. some people started saying, "You want to get rid of the drugs in the jail? Get rid of yes. uh, Hayward." Yeah. So I, I tried to get. I, I I got transferred to another jail, right? And I said, "I'm going to be the model correction officer." That's it okay. for me. Uh, at this time, they had reduced the child support, so I was making decent regular pay, right? And I said, "I'm going to stop." Um, so I'm in a, I'm in a, a jail that, that's called the Tombs, right? It's off of Rikers Island, but it's like the courthouse. It's like as soon as you get arrested, you go to the Tombs, and then from the Tombs, you go to Rikers Island. So I'm in there, and like the first day, first two days there, everything's going going well. I'm working with a partner of mine, and we're handing in. It's like an intake area where you just got arrested, like 30 or 60 or in one one cell. So it's feeding time, and we give them these hard peanut butter sandwiches and a carton of milk, right? So I noticed an inmate, old inmate, didn't get up off the floor to get his milk. Another inmate is like, if he don't want his milk or his peanut butter sandwich, I'll take it. So the officer, not caring, gave it to him. Long story short, day went by, the inmate was dead in the pen. Right. No. And from officer neglect, nobody went over to check on them, tap them, make them stand up. Because you're supposed to make them stand up to come, even if they don't want the peanut butter sandwich. Right. So that we know that you didn't get poked up or nothing happened to you in there. So I'm working there and I'm thinking, I, I'm thinking I escaped. But lo and behold, I get modified. I get modified. And I get modified by a captain that came in with me. Matter of fact, me and this captain, I'm going to tell you what happened. I'm brand new on the job and me and this captain both brand new on the job. So we're in this housing area and the inmate is challenging me and I'm, you know, being, you know, the, uh, the CEO that I am, I tell him, uh, when I come back from lunch, me and you, I'm going to take this shield off. I'm going to fuck you up. Right. Boom. I go to lunch. Alarm happens. So alarm. This is a you know alarm is when all the officers are sitting in a lunch area, and then a, a bell rings that lets us know another officer is having a problem that we all got to go to that housing area to help the officer. But right. we got to put the riot gear on and everything. Alarm happens. I put the riot gear on and I run with the squad, like twelve of us, 
down there and I noticed we going to my housing area that I just left. When I get there, um, the officer comes out stuttering. She says, gunshots. And we like gunshots. She said, somebody in there shot a gun off inside the housing area. And I could tell it was real because all of the inmates was at the gate trying to wanting to get out, not not wanting to be in there because somebody in there shooting. Right. So one by one, we took the inmates out, pat them down, laid them on the floor, handcuffed them, pat them down, laid them on the floor, handcuffed them until all the inmates were out. When we went inside, uh, we saw an inmate laying on the bed with a gunshot wound inside the jail. So. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that, I don't know how how would you get a gun in the jail? But okay, I mean, other than an officer bringing it, so well, you weren't you were a model officer for at this at that time. Yes, at that time. Oh. So that was like the first sign that hmm, something's crazy. And then you look at at the senior officers; they they looking like this is nothing new to them. To me, how did a gun get in? And then the guy get shot. But long story short, somebody smoked a gun in there to the inmate. So the inmate could shoot another inmate and they could get a big lawsuit against the city. Because how am I getting shot inside the jail? And, I, and, so I, they, so, and, and the, the it's they didn't find the gun. They found they it. find the gun, but they yes. don't know who shot him. No. Okay. Later and on he not. talked. Later on he talked. They found out everything. That's how I know it was an intricate plot to sue the city. So what did they because guess what? Whether they did or not, I don't know, but it still may raise a whole bunch of eyebrows. How did this gun get uh, inside the jail? And the same guy that was with me when we found the gun is the same guy years later that modified me, that came, told me to meet him in his office, took my shield, took my gun, and told me I'm placed on restricted duty and that they would notify me why. Now, like I told you, I thought I escaped right. from uh, Rikers Island and, and that lifestyle. So for four months, I'm sweating, trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Uh, I covered, I, I dotted my eyes, I crossed my T's, who snitching, who could have did this, who could have did that? Because I know they're not going to modify me if they don't have something. Right. So. That was like the beginning of the end. Now I'm on a restricted duty. I'm not on Rikers Island. I'm in a jail in Queens, working the elevator away from inmates and away from everybody else, waiting to see what's going to happen. You know, and then it happened. <laughs> how long? So how long were you? It was four months. About four months. They came to my home. They took me down to an office and Who's they set me down. Uh, the police internal or? affairs for, for the jail. corrections. Yeah. Okay. So they sat me in the office and they said, um, uh, you know why you're here? No, I'm playing dumb. No, because I'm going to take everything with me to the grave. I know you never caught me with no drugs. I have no drugs on me, no drugs in my car, no drugs nowhere. So let's find out what, what, what you got. Right. So they said, we just want to show you something. So I'm sitting at a table and I look at a screen on a wall and they have a video of me meeting a girl outside and she's handing me the drugs, the drugs okay. that I was so comfortable and careless. I've been doing this a while with her that I didn't check it. I didn't look in the bag and I took it right inside to the inmate. It was marked drugs. So she was coming to testify and the inmate was coming to testify to get less time that I met her, they had me on video, they had me look at the video, they asked me, is that me? I wouldn't I wouldn't acknowledge that that's me, but it, it was me, like clear as day. Right. And uh, so that was my downfall. The, the mock drugs went inside and to get less of time, they were coming to court to testify against me. The thing that shocked me and my family was in the front page of the paper, because I've been on the front page of the paper four or five times. Um, they said if convicted of all charges, he faces the rest of his, his life in jail. So that shook me. But my street knowledge said, 
No, well, that, that's them stacking the charges. Yes. And like, yeah, we got yes. them for 35 charges. We're stacking them. There's 10, you know, 10 years a piece. It could be 300 years. That's natural life. That's, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So did they arrest you? They just showed it to you. And they showed me that video. And once I, I wouldn't, after that, I clammed up. So once I clammed up, they told me stand up. They read me my rights. They took these handcuffs and put them on me. And they booked me. They booked me along with six other officers that was doing it in other jails. Oh, okay. So basically, they had me already. They were just making, building a case so that people could see that, oh, the internal affairs is really on them and they're really trying to prevent the jail, the drugs from coming inside the jail. So I got booked, front page of the paper. Uh, I was going to bail out. And when, they, when I went to arraignment, I looked behind me, my mother, my sister, because I, I tried to handle it myself, okay? I know I'm an officer. Of course, I've never been in trouble before. You know, that didn't fly. So they booked me, and they, uh, they wouldn't take me to Rikers Island. Right. Because once word got to Rikers Island, they started rioting because the inmates considered me a good dude. I was so much of a good dude that when I got when I really got booked and went upstate, they labeled the, all the gang members labeled me bulletproof. I mean, don't hurt him, don't touch him, because he was a good guy. I looked out for a lot of people. You know? Right. So, so, I mean, you but you didn't bond out. Like, what was the bond? Or they wouldn't um, allow you. They didn't give you bond. They gave me like thirty thousand dollar bond. I could have bailed out easy, but in my mind, I knew they had me. Yeah. In my mind, I'm going to need that money, <laughs> you know, for whatever time that they was going to give me. I didn't know at the time. And I wasn't going to waste it on some lawyer because I seen what they had. Right. You got somebody to testify. You got me on film. You know, so all it was was a waiting game for me to see how much time they was going to give me. You know, they came back with various offers and stuff like that. And um, what was the first offer? First offer was uh, what four and a half to twelve. Okay. And, and what does that uh, mean? I don't. I only know. I know. I know the federal system. So if you in four years you can you can get um parole, parole. if you yes. if the parole board board allows yes. it. Yes. Maximum you'll do is twelve. Twelve years. Okay. So um, Damn. I was going to take it. Are you serious? I, I was going to take it, but um, I called home and mom went to put all the chips in there because I had the money. Nobody, see, nobody knew what I was doing, so nobody knew I had the money. Right. So just when I was going to take it, I guess I took too long to answer. Thank God. They came with another offer because they wanted to get a conviction. Right. So they came with two flat, two years flat with one year post release supervision. Okay. I ripped his shirt. I ripped his shirt getting the pen out of his pocket to sign <laughs> <laughs> to sign that that agreement because I knew it was no such thing. And we just because other officers bailed out, right, and fought it. By the time I came home from prison, they were going in, right. I already knew. So I said, let me, that two years, I already had been in there five months. I only had to do 20 months out of the 24 months. And then one year, give me that. You know, even though it was horrific because being law enforcement locked behind the bars, I'm going to tell you what they did. I've never been in trouble before a day in my life. So I'm thinking I can get work release, get some kind of program and go home within two, three months, maybe six months. I get in there and the sergeant, when you go to when you go to prison, everybody gets a physical. They want to know if you got any kind of anything. So it's like a gymnasium for the officers and inmates, one by one, getting a physical, getting shots, whatever you want to get. So in front of a gymnasium full of hundreds and hundreds of inmates, the sergeant said, Hey, well, stand up. So I stood up and loud, so it was quiet as church in there. He said, how long will your correction officer on Rikers Island? 
the yeah, but wait a minute. I thought you so I thought so you did that so the inmates didn't know like these same inmates at this prison aren't thinking he's a good guy. No. Well, I guess what? Certain inmates that has certain status sent word he's a good guy, right? But they don't control all the inmates. Yeah. So right. what the sergeant did, he did that. So he said, listen, to protect you and my officers, now I got to put you in protective custody. Okay. So once they put you in protective custody, you can't be awarded work release or any kind of program. So that means you got to do the whole two years. Right. And you got to, so, I was going to say, you're, you're going to spend a lot of time in your cell. 22 gonna, hour lockdown. I was 22 hour lockdown, one hour to, I guess, recreation. Yeah. You got to take a shower. You, get, you can either get take a shower, phone. use the phone or go or, or go to rec. You That's can't it. do all three. You can't even do That's two. It. That's it. That is it. Uh, um, did you get good time? You get good time on two years, Four right? Months. Four, Four months. Four months. Okay. Yeah. So. What about halfway house? Once you're in protective custody, none of those programs are afforded to you. Now, if I took the risk, like I was a tough guy, and say put me in general population as a correction officer, I probably wouldn't be here today. Yeah, it could have gone bad. I was going to say, yeah. I, you know, when you had mentioned that story, I, I was locked up in a, a, a county jail. I mean, it was the U.S. Marshals holdover, but it's they're in county jails. Mm -hmm. you know, they just have they just have one little one pod where it's a it's for the federal age or federal um, uh, inmates. So I was in this pod, and uh, there was a guy. I, he listen, this is a black guy, big guy. He had to be six foot three, six four, big guy. But keep in mind, th there's maybe fifty guys in this unit, and thirty of them. Maybe 35 are all Mexican. Okay. Maybe there's like 10 black guys, four or five white guys. So this, this, the big black guy decided, and there's one TV and mm. we're all in one unit, you know, what one big pod and there's cells and each cell holds, there's like five cells and each cell holds whatever, 10 guys. So finally, after a week of this guy being here, he comes up and he decides he's not watching you know, Mexican, Mex or Spanish TV anymore. Mm -hmm. And he walked up and he just changes the TV. And I mean, these guys go nuts mm -hmm. and they, they're, they're screaming and hollering and they go to turn back and he pushes one of the guys back. Like, no, nah, we're not, I'm running this TV. Now we're watching what I want to watch and you ain't going to do nothing. And, um, yeah. So, so the, the, I later talked to him after the, uh, Mexicans jumped on him. I mean, there was like 10 of them, like they, mm. they was only, only 10 of them attacked him because only 10 could get to him at one time. Mm. And so later, uh, when I saw that dude again, uh, in, I don't know if it was in the shoe or if it was at, I think it was at ACDC. I saw him. He was, I think he might've been in my same pot. And I said, Hey bro. I said, what were you thinking? He goes, and, and he looked at me, he goes, man, they're little bro. They're like your size, cock. Like they're smaller than you. Those guys, some of those guys are five, two, five, three. I thought I can take them. And he said, and I said, but you, you couldn't take them. And he goes, no, there was 10 of them. He said, it doesn't matter how big you are. He goes, there's mm -hmm. 10 of these guys. He's, and he said, look, once they got him on the ground, talk about somebody screaming. He, mm -hmm. he went from being a, a, a big badass to squealing. I mean, I mean, it was like, it was like <laughs> Jesus, like, and, and, you know, and I was like, yeah, bro, there's 10 of them. Like they're all like, he's like, yeah, once that one, one of them got a hold of my leg and they just yanked my leg out and I hit the ground and they all jumped on me. He said, I, I realized I fucked up really yeah. fucked up. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, I, I, I get, you know, and these guys didn't have knives. Like they didn't come at it with knives. They just beat the hell out of them. So uh, on a, on a non, on general population where, where, the inmates have knives. It could go really bad. It could go really bad. I don't care how tough you are. I don't care. Yeah. I, I've had officers get revenge or use tactics where they'll put a crip in an all-blood house. Yeah. And one time the crip went in there, big guy, 
Now, you know the cell phone is our eyes to the world. I'm mean, not the, the telephone. Right. Talking to your, your family, your girl, your kid, your friend telling you, yeah, such and such went on here, blah, blah, blah. He took the phone. He threw a, pulled a shank out, a knife, a, a homemade knife, put it in the middle of the floor and said, this is my phone now. Whoever wants this phone, meet me in my cell. Yeah. We, we had to get him out of there hospital but guess what in jail these guys try it think about it, that that black guy let's say none of the mexicans were brave enough to jump on him guess what that mean he run that tv mm -hmm. nobody's yeah. going to challenge him you, you know what's so funny is you and i talking about this mm -hmm. to someone you know, on the street that's never been locked up for any length of time i mean going to jail for three days doesn't mean shit you know but for somebody who's never been locked up for any length of time, like they have no idea. It sounds stupid to them, but they have no idea how important those things are and how serious that situation of the phone, the TV going in your cell, walk someone walking in your cell, being respectful to each other, yes. taking someone, yes. someone's, you know, someone's a uh, um, biscuit off of their, their, their tray or, you know, like here it's like, whatever. Who cares? Mm -hmm. But in prison, it suddenly becomes over. It, it, it's it's worth fighting. It's worth, you know, stabbing someone. It's worth beating them. It's worth, you know, whatever. Like, it, it's it's insane how important those things are when you're limited to, when you're down to nothing. Yes. How people will fight over a magazine, a, a pencil, a book. Mm -hmm. I, I want the guy get the hell beat out of him with a, a belt and a lock because he lost a guy's book. Yeah, I Listen, gave it to a guy and the guy lost it. And I don't know what to say. And he, and he was like, yo, bro, well, you owe me, it's nine bucks for a new one. You owe me nine bucks. He said, go fuck yourself, man. That dude said, all right, walked off, came back two minutes later. Bam, 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 bam. Just guys screaming blood all mm -hmm. over the hell. I mean, it was like, and this guy was tiny too. The guy that beat him up. I remember his name was <laughs> truck. He was like five foot two. I was like, truck. Truck Listen. was the nicest guy. Mm. <laughs> Listen. The, the, to me, the most dangerous inmate is the crackhead that came off the street that don't have no family, don't have no money, don't have nothing. It was yep. a mob guy. That, I mean, he was a serious, connected guy that could have people go to your, your family, go to your house. Right. And visit your family. And this guy was on the phone. He didn't have much, but he had a little, a little time on the phone. And the mob guy snatches the phone, hung up his, his phone call. And told him, you know, basically, the fuck out of here, blah, 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 this, this, and that. Yeah, he wants right? to use the phone. And he threatened them. He said, listen, I'll have them come over there. I'll make one phone call, and they'll be at your house tomorrow. Literally, they just know this guy didn't have him. He was homeless. Right. So he comes back, and he takes the cord, and he wraps it around this guy to get into it, and he starts choking him. As he's choking him, he grabs his hand starts stomping on his hand and breaks his hand, breaks his fingers. And as we come in there rushing the handcuff, uh, and he tells him, how you going to call somebody with no fingers? Right. Like, he didn't care. Like, call who you want to call. I don't have nobody. I have nothing to lose. So all those things, commissary, phone call, letters, visits, uh, a pack of chips, TV. If everybody, when I was locked up, they love, uh, what is that, King from Queens. They just love watching the rerun at the rerun. We don't see it on the tongues, but everybody gather around to watch it. I mean, yeah, it is it is crucial. And people don't know, they take for granted. I remember MH used to ask me all the time, hey, when well, you're going to go home, right? And you're going to go and you're going to have a beer tonight, mm -hmm. right? A, a beer. Right. Or soda. No, it has soda, but something that was just everybody would normally have that they missed. Right. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna have a beer. And they just sit there and be envious. Want me to tell the whole story about how I'm gonna drink a beer, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> um so so you you did so you did almost two years in protective custody and 
you get out, no halfway house. Like what's waiting for you when you get out? Like what was the, like, did you, please, like, did you have a plan at the, you had two years to think about what you were going to do. I'm going to tell you what I did, right? Okay. I started doing research, right? In New York City, there's certain jobs that hire felons. So now I'm a felon. Now I got felonies. So from jail, I started studying the CDL book to get to become a, a you know drive trucks. I right. heard that we could do that with a felony. And I looked up all the city agencies that take people with felonies. So I applied from jail to be a city bus driver. I was supposed to come home in January. They called me, no, they called me December and told me that I had an interview coming up February. Now I'm in, I'm in, I'm in prison. So I got <laughs> out in January you? because they, I, I, I filled it out and mailed it to them. So they mailed my mom and say, oh, they sent a letter. She said, you, you got an interview to be a bus driver. February. Now, Matt, I was getting out January. So I studied the CDL book. Study, study, study. I got out January 8th. By January 12th, I had my permit. That's all I needed. I went to go to my PO to tell him that I had an interview to be a bus driver. He said, you can't have that job because they make the same money a correction officer made. And if you get that job, you're going to go back to selling drugs. And he wouldn't allow me to get that job. Well, he's saying you only have to get a, you, you're only allowed to get a job making more money than a correctional officer. How's that possible? You have a felony yeah. now. So you are only could get jobs making less money or just because you got to oh. get, you got to get a job or which they're going to send you back. Yeah. Right. So when I told him I was going to get a good job, no, I don't want you to have that job because now you're going to be making too much money and you've shown that you're irresponsible. Yeah, yeah but your, your crime was situational. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Left to your own devices. You, you, you had never, you know, you'd never sold drugs. You'd never done all that. It was, it was a complete situational uh, crime. Yeah, but come on. They, they don't look at it like that. They look at it. You disrespect the badge. Number right. one, because guess what? It was jobs I went to that if I was this Joe Schmuck drug dealer that came home, I would get those jobs. One of my charges is bribe receiving. So now if you Troy Johnson on the corner that got caught for pitching, they're not going to give you a bribe receiving charge. So when they made it so that when you go, because when you go to these jobs, you got to allocate what you went to jail for. Right. And when it, because my charges don't say, Correction officer, drug seller, drug dealer. Right. It is a drug sale. So uh, it's a million people who got drug sale charges that will get hired. But then now they want to dig deep. That that bribery even makes them dig deep and say, "What what were you doing that they considered you getting bribed? Because a crackhead coming up to you buying drugs is not bribe." Right. And then you got to go into who you were. And then so that's why I wrote my book, Corruption Officer, uh, to tell everybody about my journey to tell people that don't let felonies define you because now since then i'm gonna tell you something crazy i don't vote it i don't stood jury duty and as we speak right now i'm a superintendent for the city again right so you no know, I, I let people know don't let jail define you and those those myths don't let those myths stop you from uh improving your situation As a matter of fact i got a year to retire so, you know, I did a 360, you know, some people are hard learners. I'm not. All it took was that one time. How long? When did you get out? What year did you get out? I got out in 2008. Okay. So I've been out for a while. Oh yeah. You've been, so you've been on your job. So when you were on, what, what'd you do when you were on probation? I mean, what did um, you, what job did he allow you to get? He allowed me to get an ambulate driving job for, for seniors for $7 an hour. Lately, you're so irritated. I can see it in your face. <laughs> because people don't understand how the odds be stacked against you that they want you to go back to prison. Yeah. Come on, Duke. I, I did something proactive. I was going to get a job as a bus driver, making pretty decent money, not, not dealing with people's money, nobody's kid, not just dealing with the pub, public. And you wanted me to 
get a seven dollar an hour job because what happened when I when I did because 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 I kind of had money. Right. They, they didn't, didn't know about. But the thing was, um, when it, every week you had to report to your parole officer. So he would tell me I would try to get there at nine or ten o'clock in the morning. So let's get this over with. He would make me wait. I'll get there at nine o'clock in the, in the morning. He wouldn't call me till five o'clock in the, in the afternoon. Today, th- th- you ain't got no job. You, where you got to be? This is my time. He would make me sit there all day till five o'clock. Till it's time for him to go home. Then come make me take a piss test. Right. And I'm like, bro, not to, not so, not because somebody's supposed to look at me differently because I did commit these crimes, but I knew that I was going to mess up and do drugs. And my curfew was nine o'clock. I was at home seven o'clock every night because the Knicks played and he would come to my house seven thirty, eight o'clock. My curfew ain't till nine o'clock, but I'm here. You're not going to catch me out past curfew. I'm not doing nothing wrong. No. Right. So, and when I got off, that was it. I just went and I started working, uh, doing, using my CDL to drive big trucks, doing construction. And then um, I got me a city job again. And so far, the rest is history so far. You know, I go around and I talk to kids and I do speaking engagements to teach people, talk to people about the importance of staying out of prison. You know, when did you write your book? I wrote my book in two, I wrote my book in prison. Right. And it got, I self-published it 2012. And then I got signed to Simon and Schuster. It's the biggest book publishing company in New York. So okay. I got a, a, nice. a book deal for my book, Corruption Officer. And then I'm going to tell you, it, it, it's it's been, God has been looking out for me because Will Smith optioned my book to make it a series on FX. So I was I've been I was signed for Will Smith to uh, for about five or six years making that happen, FX Disney and stuff like that. So uh, recently, you know, they put a hold on it because Will Smith, uh, you know, he's doing Will he's Smith had stuff. Some, he's had some issues. He's, <laughs> he's, yeah. He's, yeah. Oh, it's so funny too because I I used to think I I honestly I thought. I, I honestly thought like just Will Smith was like the coolest until, that, he, until that happened. I think I he think. still is, but you know, everybody go through things that behind closed doors with their family. I'm not the one to judge. Right. You know, but you know, the way it plays out. Well, let me, you know, let, me put, let me put it this way. I would have never expected that. Like that would, he was the last person in the world that I think would have done something like that. I would have. Yeah, me too. Didn't see and that. I grew up on Will Smith. Huh? I grew up on Will Smith, so yeah, when, that happened, when, when I saw that, I, I, you know, I saw the video and I'm like, is it a stunt? Is it a joke? When my, listen, when my buddy sent it to me, I thought, is it AI or something? Like, what, what is that? I don't understand. And, you know, and then, of course, more videos came up and, you know, and I looked and I was like, oh, my God. And I called my buddy and he was like, yeah, bro, that's what just happened. I was yeah. like, holy shit. But you know what? Mm-hmm. When we were talking on the phone, and I, I mentioned this to my wife, um, like I could completely see this being n- not a movie, but like a series. Like I, I could see this being like a Netflix or Hulu or Apple series because it, and I was telling my, uh, do you remember, was it a shield? Yes. You know, we're like, shield. He was a good he was a good cop, but he was a bad cop. You, 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 Shield was kind of like Chicago PD, right? But yeah, oh right, exactly. Where it's like you know, it's like it's kind of like it's funny because there are these, you know, in Florida, and, and honestly, honestly, there, I'm sure sheriffs are like this everywhere. Everybody, Florida's mm-hmm. got a bad rap, you know. And, and keep in mind, my my wife, you know, did like five years right for okay. a, for a, a meth conspiracy, um, and and so. You know, the the way you know we'll watch these things on sheriffs and stuff, right? And some of the sheriffs down here are just insane. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know if you've seen them. They'll do like press uh, uh, press conferences and they talk about like, listen, you know, the w- we found this guy dead in the street. He's a known burglar. What we think happened was that he broke in someone's house and he shot that they shot him, 
And he then ran down the street and died in the street. He's like, so we want the person to sh that shot him to come forward because mm -hmm. you're not in trouble because we encourage people to shoot burglars breaking mm -hmm. their house. So you're not in trouble. We just want to give you some free, um, uh, some free gun range time because you really should have killed him in his house or in yeah. your house. And, and like they, and you're like that, this is a press, press conference. What they have, one of the better ones is, uh, they, there was a guy who was in his house who'd outrun the cops, escaped into like his mobile home mm -hmm. and the cops, he fired at the police from inside the mobile home and they fired a hundred and like 90 shots in the mobile home and, and killed him. Mm -hmm. And when the reporter said, you know, sheriff, like, why did your shit, why did they fire 190 bullets into the mobile home? And he mm -hmm. said, because they ran out of bullets. That's why he said, cause That's dead, he is cause dead isn't dead. He is dead. You can't be dead enough when you're firing at, at law enforcement. I mean, they're insane, but so these guys are, you know, they're super gung ho, mm -hmm. you know, um, non-politically correct. But that's also, and my wife says this all the time. She's like, yeah, but that's also the guy I want showing up at my house. If someone breaks in, you know yeah. what I'm saying? She's also that that's, all, you know, unfortunately you don't get the nice, sweet, politically correct, good guy that is also a, a, a tough, brave officer that runs into a, you know, a building where there's somebody in there with a gun. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's tough. Like you don't get that hard ass guy that's gung ho and going to save someone's life. And he's also mm -hmm. a caring individual. That's probably just yeah. not the way it works. So I, we were, so we were talking about your thing and I was like, like, I could see that being a series. Like, like he's, he's doing stuff. He's bringing in cell phones. He's bringing in, you know, drugs periodically. He's, you know, but but he's also like stopping things from happening. He's got stuff going on at home. Inmates are maybe something goes wrong and an inmate puts a hit out on him um, on the street. Like I, I was like, you know, all they got to do is follow the book for a couple seasons and then they build the characters and then they can do whatever they want with it. You know, some talented writer Bro. will turn you into. So, I mean, I can see that like it, it that's a Bro. super unique story. It's, a, it's already a script. And you're funny. You're funny because you have a talent. <laughs> it's a script just like that. Oh, is it? Because, yes, for a series with characters already. Like I said, it was almost into fruition with FX. Almost. So right now, I'm still shopping the script around. And is that because what it is, and is this is just, listen, let me just say this. If I had, of course, we all had it all do again, we wouldn't do it. Of course, right? Yeah, right, right. But it was like I was Robin Hood for the neighborhood, meaning somebody's kid get in trouble. They got to put commissary on his books. We got the week, month after month, become expensive. You spend $100 with me, $200 with me, he eats for about six months. Yeah, I, I don't think we ever really, you touched on it, but you didn't explain that, like, if I'm bringing it, him in, $300 worth of tobacco. I'm charging 300 bucks. So I'm getting my 300, but yes. that guy is able to turn that, that $300 pack of tobacco into $1,500 because yes. it's going to roll these little tiny cigarettes, which are amazing how small they are. And he's yes. getting $20 for each one of these little cigarettes. Yes. And, and there's no real money being exchanged in that. It, it's all commissary. Mm -hmm. It's all stamps. It's all. Yes. Um, yes. And it's funny how a lot of times, and just like you, you did mention this is that, you know, as fucked up as it is, that those are the things that also keep balance in, you know, in those, those, um, in the pod, I don't know what you, well, you call them housing units or pods. Housing area, uh, cell area, housing areas. And I'm gonna be honest with you, people may not realize it. I saved a lot of lives. Right. Right. It's not right. Is, is is what I did was wrong. But in the gist of what was going on, uh, I saved a lot of a lot of lives with people who didn't have and situations that was going to go down over stuff that we take advantage of, you know, but was serious to people. I remember a guy was going to beat a guy up because he wanted the guy had real mayonnaise <laughs> in his cell. And the gentleman wanted real mayonnaise 
on his sandwich. And, right. you know, that's the guy that has the real mayonnaise. You know, so it was, it became a big, and I was like, is it mayonnaise? Are you freaking crazy? Calm down. The next day I bought him a bacon, egg and cheese. And I, uh, they he milked that bacon, egg and cheese sandwich. He ate it like, <laughs> like all week. Like it was like, he never tasted that before bacon, real bacon, but stuff like that. Individuals that came in that didn't have nothing. I would say like five bucks, put it on his commissary so you can go shopping. So now he's not robbing, stealing, stabbing the next person. It It is a balance and it yeah. keeps a peace, you know, whether they realize it or not. Like I said before, what you learn in the academy is the structure. Listen, if you get caught doing something wrong, we showed you the right way to do it. But we all know that's not how you're going to do business once right. you become a correction officer. No. Well, I, um, did you ever see Carlito's way? I've seen it. So you remember, uh, Gino. Was, yeah, yeah. He was in, uh, er, it, there's, there's a, there's a, a scene where there's a, a mobster that's locked up and I don't know where he is. It's, I, I, but he's locked up and mm-hmm. basically, and they're like, there's like a CO, like he's got a, the CO, he's paying the CO obviously. You know, okay. he comes in, he meets with the lawyer and he's like, and he tells the CEO, all right, all right, I'm good. And then he says, you see that, that, that's, or, you know, you see that guard? And he's like, yeah, he said, that guard's going to leave a door open for me and I'm going to be in the water at this time. Remember the guy Carlito's lawyer kills somebody? Uh, I don't remember. I, I've seen him. It was a you long gotta, time ago. Yeah, you got to watch. You got to watch it again. He he ends okay. up killing. He ends up killing this mob guy because he stole like a million dollars from him. Like for his defense, the he says his lawyer, the mob guy had somebody drop off a million dollars to the lawyer. The lawyer says I never got it. He did get it, and so the mob oh. guy is like, I know you got it. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to have a boat, and you're going to get a boat, and that boat's going to be waiting for me. When I get, when this guard lets me out, but I'm saying there are so many, you see what I'm saying? I'm like, there are so many things that a guard is a part of and can be a part of in a series where that series can go into all kinds of things. It can, and it doesn't have to take place in just the prison because that guard is also being approached by people, just like you said, on the street, Mm -hmm. you know, there's who knows what other things uh, happen on the street that aren't even taking place. That's 40 hours in the inside the, the prison. That can have a whole other thing going on with mobsters. Hey, listen, drug listen, dealers, listen, 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 you got it. You're hired. What? <laughs> yeah, you no, got to get this off the ground. I was excited no, about you, this. You, you are so on point with it. I can I can email you my pitch deck. And I'm telling okay. you, everything that you thought, boom, already. I got characters upon characters that's never been seen before. That's why uh, I've, I've had a few offers to do it. A um, couple of names were attached. You know, I'm not going to say because it, never, it didn't come into fruition. But right. um, but this, it doesn't even have to just be Rikers Island. See, Rikers Island is like one of the most notorious jails known around the world. You know, uh, but the storyline, like I said, Listen, it can go to so too. many different. Uh, the main character, the the cops, the two. Matter of fact, okay, I mean, I, I don't, corruption officer is my first book. Perpetrator with a badge. The second book is called Cops, the two. What would you do to feed your kids? And it's about female correction officers. Oh, like, yeah. Yes, I have. Like the script to me is amazing. Of course, I'm gonna say it's amazing because I wrote it. But the, my book is uh, five star reviews. The script is that it, it's funny that you you saw that, and I I never had the conversation with you again uh, before about the series, and that's exactly what the series is about. Yeah, that's exactly well, good. You know, it's a corrupt um, judge. It's a corrupt judge. Stuff going on. Uh, because, uh, you know, you have a lot of series where there's a bad guy that's the good guy. Yeah. It, you know what I mean? But that that's the thing is that, look, like, like I can't watch another fucking mobster movie. Um, you know, like, but you see what I'm saying? Like, that's, like, I really like unique stories. And that's why, so, and, and I interview a lot of guys. 
Okay. So, you know, very seldomly do I schedule something and then go and tell my wife, like, listen to this, you know? And she's <laughs> like, what is it? And then I tell her and she's like, and, and you know, I started talking to her about this and this, and then she's, she's great because she almost never talks. And she says, well, I don't have to talk because all you do is talk. And, and she's, <laughs> oh, she's perfectly okay to just sit back and go, okay. Okay. <laughs> and she lets me just go and go. And I was like, think about how, what a unique, like I've never seen, if you said, okay, so there's a mob guy, I've seen it. I've seen five, I've seen 20 different variations of the mob guy. Okay. okay. Well, the corrupt cop. I've seen 20 different version versions of the corrupt cop, you know? Okay. Well, it's a drug dealer. Who's really a good guy, but he also does bad things. There's about 500 different versions. Well, mm -hmm. let's, let's switch it up. Okay. Instead of Coke, we're going to make this one about meth. Oh, wow. You've really done something there. Oh, no, no. But this one, we're going to make this one about, um, it's marijuana. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. So it's all the same. You know, it's a lot of the same thing, but yours is extremely unique because I've never seen one done from the perspective of a guard who's surrounded by criminals, who's managing this. And there's so many different things that you can do with that, um, you know, you know, with that setup or, or with that character that doesn't just yes. limit him to being inside of the prison. And keep in mind too, the other added incentive is that after season two or three, then you have investigations that he almost gets caught. Then you have, you know what I'm saying? You've got the guys, you've got the, uh, in federal prison, it would be, they call them SIS. I don't know what the, the internal affairs for you guys, uh -huh. Yes, you know, where you've got one or one, one guy who's got a hard on for him. Maybe there's Always. three guys there. Yeah. There's those kinds of things. And these, there's, there's all the politics. Like it's a perfect fucking, uh, yes. scenario or situation to really have a drama but that could also have periodic periodically could have violence, you know, elements of violence in it. Listen, so you ever seen Oz, the show Oz? Yes. I was terrified of Oz. I saw Oz before I went to prison. <laughs> yeah. One Oz, of the reasons I def desperately didn't want to go to prison. <laughs> Imagine Oz, and it was a show called The Wire. Right. That's my series combined. Right. So that's your, uh, what do they always do? It's, you know. Self-pitch? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, 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 I'm pretty, the same way you feel about it, uh, a lot of people feel about it. It's just, I just got to keep pushing to make it happen. Well, when does your option expire with Will Smith's production company? Uh, it did. It did oh. like about six months ago. So now I have all the rights. I have the script. I have the rights. The only thing I don't have the rights to my book, I got a book publishing deal. So my book is on Amazon. No, Amazon.com. You, you own your mm -hmm. life rights. So your life rights are, yes. are no longer options. No, I own and my life rights. What was he doing? Optioning it every 18 months? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We were almost there. I don't know. I listen. I. I Couple I of things stopped. The, the, the pandemic happened. Slowed right. things down. Then we were just coming out the pandemic. I just I signed with uh, FX. I signed with Disney because Disney owns FX, and we were about to get ready to roll. And so, you know, they, I'm just gonna say they changed their mind. <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, so it's available. Anybody that's interested can contact me and then what's on, make it's it on work. Amazon, right? The, the book's the on book Amazon.com. Amazon you know, well, I, I'll you know, leave. How about, I mean, I'll leave your, the amazon.com. I'll leave the Amazon link okay. in the description box and I'll leave if you want. I mean, it's up to you. I can leave your, your, like your email, your contact email in there, yes, you know, or definitely. Okay. I was going to say a lot of times people will email me and say, Hey bro, can you put me in contact with this person? But cause some people don't want their email, but if you do, I'll put, I'll pop the email in there. Definitely. Or they could come to my YouTube page, Gary Hayward. Oh, okay. And, uh, hear about craziness. And you, stuff. But I'm sure you, you, I'm sure you've been through some stuff yourself. Oh, listen, man. I, I, and, and I wrote, um, almost, basically two dozen stories, true crime stories when I was locked up. So, okay. and I've, I've written eight, eight true crime books. Mm. So, you know, I wrote a memoir and I've written like seven books and I think six of them I was in prison. I've written two since I got out. 
but I'm doing the same thing. I'm going through the production company. I've had stuff optioned and then 18 months, you get another check and then in 18 months, you you know, they keep optioning it and you know, it's, it's great to get a little check. I don't mind. I like getting that, that check. It's always come when I need it the most, by the way. Yeah. Same here. Same here. It's the big check that I want, you know, (laughs) and then let's go forward, move forward with it. Right. And, and, you know, I've got, you know, I, I've got a, a, you know, some, some project, I have some projects with, a, with one company, with a law firm. I've had a couple of them optioned and some options have expired. Some are, they're still um, doing it, but, gotcha. you know, but it's the same thing, bro. And I've been out for, I've been doing this for four years and it, it is, it's like, I would rather deal with criminals than people in Hollywood because, you know, at least in criminal, like they'll at least tell you to your face, go fuck yourself. These guys yeah. will spin you and spin you. And if I hear one more person say, we're going to pitch it at the meeting on Friday, you know, or we got to talk to Jan or Jennifer's on vacation for the next two weeks. But when she gets back, this is the first yeah. thing on our agenda. Oh my God. And then sometimes you call their phone, they don't answer the phone no more. Right. That's oh yeah. It. yeah. And then suddenly they just ghost you. And what's funny yeah. is I've had, people ghost me and then you then two weeks or uh, two years later they you get a a text from them and says hey wow i was in a meeting the other day and i remember and i was they were looking for you know a bank robbery story and i remembered you'd written that bank robbery story about this got that guy and i went to your website and i got it do you mind if i pitch it to what was the guy's name uh 50 cents company and it's like are we going to a, are we, are we not, we're not talking about the two years that you, I sent you three emails and five texts. Like, are we, mm. we're, that's over. Mm-hmm. Oh, when did you, when did that happen? You know, Matt, I got a new cell phone. Oh, you're a scumbag. But yes, yeah, please pitch it to 50 cents. Hey, hey. It's disgusting. I'm disgusted with myself. Um, Bro, 50 cent, 50 cent is his office is here in New York. Oh. When, I, when I got a job, I had a, a maintenance worker job. I was, I was a maintenance worker. Part of being a maintenance worker in the basement, it it gets stopped up with feces that come up to your, your chest. So you got to unclog that drain. Oh. I got a call to come to 50 Cent's office on 40th Street and 8th Avenue. Bro, I left work. I didn't tell my boss no, nothing. I had a dozen of my books in my hand. And if you can only see me, the guy looking at me. Knocking on the door with, with feces matter all over myself, saying, hey, this is my book. 50 Cent would love it. Da, da, da. You know, my book got on his desk, but it, he, I guess it never really reached to him. Because uh, one of the stories is Tony Ayo, his right-hand protege. When he went to jail, I took care of him. Right. Gave him cigarettes and stuff like that. Made sure because they was warring with uh, Irv Gotti, Murder, Inc. So Tony Yeo told me to come down there to see him. Okay. But when I went, 50 Cent wasn't there. You know, you always have them close calls. But listen, both of us got to keep trying. That's all we got to do is keep pushing. So I was going to mention something to you. Um, so I have on my website, I've got, I think I probably got 17 or 18 of my stories, right? On, and, and But they're not, they're not the full length books. Okay. They're the, a synopsis. So let's say your book is 90,000 words. A mm-hmm. synopsis would be 10%. It'd be like 9,000 words. Yeah. So a little snippet. Yeah. Right. Right. What not, I don't mean taking a piece. You're, you're condensing it like almost like a news, almost like an article. Okay. So it, it really very much is just like reading a Rolling Stone article, which typically mm-hmm. are about six to 8,000 words. Mm-hmm. The nice thing is you're not really constrained. Like if your book's 80,000 words, then the, your, your synopsis should be roughly about eight or 9,000 words, right? Something somebody can read in less than an hour. And then of course you want to write just like your, your, the back jacket cover for your book. Yeah. So here's the thing about that. I have a, a website and a lot of times when I pitch these guys, like I'm not, I can't give you a 90,000 word book. They're never going to read it, but they will read the 8,000 word synopsis. And I even have, I I even took it a step further because I realized, listen, these guys, they may not even read this. I even had it narr each one of them is narrated. So they can listen to it in their car. uh, You can click a button on my website and it brings you to YouTube and it reads you the story 
45 minutes, 50 minute story on your way to work. It will read you the story if you don't have time. And I tell them that, you know, so you might want to think about getting, creating a synopsis of your story, definitely a narration. You can narrate it like it's yours is, is in first person, I'm sure, because it's a memoir. Yes. So you can yes, narrate okay. it. Listen, bro, you're high I, because I got video, bro. I got video of me and my half and half. Right. I memorized my first chapter. So you know how some authors, they get their book and they read from the book and buy, they, they, they read a yeah. chapter and videotape them. No, I sit there and I act out the first chapter. Right. So. I like the connection. <laughs> yeah, you should th think about the um, think about the synopsis. Yes, I'm, I'm definitely going to think about that. That is a great yes. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching the interview. If you liked it, do me a favor, subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos like this. Share this video because it really helps me if you share the videos. Also, um, please consider joining my Patreon. I'm going to leave the link for the book in description box. I'm also going to leave his uh, YouTube channel. So I really appreciate you guys and leave me a comment in the comment section. And I will try and respond. Thank you very much. See ya.